Um, I'm very excited to interview Hugo Spowers, who is the founder of the world's first independent, independent hydrogen fuel cell car company, which is called River Simple. And um, I met Hugo several years ago, and he is one of the most revolutionary, bloody-minded entrepreneurs out there. You might ask, why are we actually conducting an interview of the founder of a transportation company at Groundswell, a farming festival? And I think that it's important to just give some context to that. This talk is not just about a car. It's equally about systemic change. And I know m many of you know Josiah, jo Josiah Meldrum, for example, of Hot and the Dogs, who has talked about the radical dislocations which take place when you actually try to think, rethink an entire industry. And this talk is no different from that in terms of getting everyone to think about Sometimes, does it make sense to throw the baby out with the bathwater? And in this case, it definitely did. So on that note, I'm going to also, um, we're, we're going to start with by asking Hugo a very basic question, first about hydrogen and what is the efficiency of hydrogen compared to um, electricity first? Well, uh, it, it, there's no doubt that there's a sort of, in cars, there's a common myth. Well, it's not a myth, really. It's absolutely true. Um, but it's peddled with ferocity that uh, you'll never beat the powertrain efficiency of a battery car. It is actually true. It's about 75 80% efficient, whereas a fuel cell, a hydrogen fuel cell powertrain is only about 45% efficient. To put it in perspective, a petrol engine powertrain is about 20% efficient. But, but actually, the, the point about uh, a hydrogen uh, technology is that the uh, the vehicle efficiency is not very well correlated with the powertrain efficiency. If you, uh, most uh, petrol powertrains are 20% efficient today, 20, 22%, but the MPG figures of cars vary wildly. And it doesn't really matter only how, the power tra how efficient the powertrain is, it also depends hugely on the weight of the car. So battery electric vehicles are very efficient for short range applications. But as you make them longer and longer range, you need more batteries and you need a bigger electric motor and a stronger chassis. So the weight spirals upwards and the efficiency completely falls off a cliff. So for longer range applications, we think about 150, 200 mile range, we can have a more efficient car even though the powertrain is less efficient. And when you're talking 300 miles plus, it's just head and shoulders ahead. Well, actually, let's actually make a, a draw a direct comparison with the love with like with the with the world's favorite electric car a tesla mm -hmm. why don't you actually illustrate that well, or compare the efficiency of the rasa the <coughs> car over there with the tesla well the tesla battery weighs more than that car does and um and uh, so the car is about four times the weight uh it's um it, it, it but Th it's not just efficiency, I think. The other thing, th there are a whole host of other things. We're all obsessed, quite understandably, with net zero and carbon emissions being the biggest, most urgent crisis we face. But if we pursue net zero to the exclusion of all else, I think it'll be a completely pyrrhic victory. And um, one of the, the most important a uh, aspects of, of battery cars is the enormous amount of critical materials they require. Um, the, as I said, the battery weighs more than our car does. It's nickel, lithium, cobalt, etc. But it's not just cars that need these raw materials. It's all sorts of other sectors like wind turbines and solar PV. And in a, a fossil-based world, we can pretty much muddle through with steel and aluminium. But it, as soon as you move to a renewable world, all these rare materials, everything rarer than copper, uh, so it's not just the nickel and lithium and things like that, but it's also iridium, it's neodymium, dysprosium, yttrium, all sorts of things we've never heard of. And we need them by at least an order of magnitude more than we've needed them in the past. And we simply can't afford to put 900 kilos of them in a car that's going to be used by one family. Those materials are needed elsewhere. So there's a whole raft of sustainability issues. There's weight of cars. Weight, we have a beastly problem with cars as bad as we do with people. And cars are getting consistently heavier. It has a whole raft of negative unintended consequences. We'll 
we'll tackle that later. Maybe okay, but you were talking about we're trying to compare the efficiency uh. and the desirability of EVs versus petrol cars versus hydrogen cars. So why don't you actually tell us the optimal use case for each one of those? Okay, okay none for petrol mm. cars. That goes without saying. And what is the correct transportation and use mix? Yeah, so we're, we're absolutely a sustainable car company. We're not a hydrogen car company. Um, batteries are really important. They have a critical role to play. Um, uh, but they're different, and we need them both. And um, we don't argue about solar PV or wind turbines, for instance. Which one's going to win the renewable energy race? They're different, and we need them both. And the same is true of batteries and hydrogen. Um, as I explained uh, just now, um, Battery electric vehicles are great for short range, but for longer range, they get heavier and heavier and less efficient. So it's the range is the biggest issue. There's a popular um, mantra that's rolled out that we need hydrogen for HGVs because they're big. And that is the right conclusion. We do need hydrogen for HGVs, but it's got absolutely nothing to do with the size or the weight. So the government's got all the right policy in place for completely the wrong reason. And... Um, Two examples we can give for that. One is you can easily make a battery electric HGV if you're happy to do 50 miles a day. But that's not what HGVs do. And it's the range and the uptime. They need to sweat the asset, keep it on the road. So they, 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 um, they can't afford enough batteries to give the range they require, and they haven't got the downtime for charging. The other end of the scale, though, is, is materials handling, forklifts and pallet carriers. The only mature market so far for hydrogen technology is in, is, is in uh, materials handling. And the pallet carrier, one man standing there with a joystick moving one pallet, is not a big device. Uh, so clearly it's nothing to do with, with size. Um, in the States, over 30% of food is now moved in warehouses by hydrogen. And it really has taken off in a, in, in a big way. And uh, again, the, the pallet carrier, it's about utilisation, uptime. You can just get more productivity out of a hydrogen um, pallet carrier than you can out of a battery one. I have and the a same dumb question. Hmm? I okay, I, will have, I need to ask The same applies question. across the spectrum from the pallet carrier up to the HGV and everything in between. And short-range battery cars, great. Long-range battery cars are completely limited. Okay, but you, so, but you, so, what is the ideal use case for a hydrogen car, and what do we do for long-range driving? I have never asked you that question. I hope it's not a trick question. No, a hydrogen car has all the flexibility and uh, ease of use that, that we come to uh, got used to with, with petrol. Um, it takes about three or four minutes to fill up. You rock up to a filling station, fill up, and um, in a few minutes, and you drive out with a few hundred miles in your tank. So it requires no behavior change at all. So for long-range applications, it's, it's, um, it's ideal. And the idea of, of um, the services on the M5 down to Cornwall on a bank holiday in the summer, if all our cars are running on batteries, is absolutely inconceivable. Um, there, is, there is no way that um <coughs> you're going to get there before the end of the... get to your holiday before the end of the bank holiday weekend. And B, you wouldn't be able to put in the infrastructure to support the enormous amount of electricity required. Okay. Uh, why don't you tell us about the efficiency of the charging infrastructure for hydrogen cars compared to EVs as oh yes. well? Because well that's a huge concern in terms of sustainability. Yes. If you, if you take a, a typical, well, quite a modest motorway services today, 20 pumps, and you replace the 20 pumps with bat fast chargers uh, like Tesla use, you'd need generously only 120 chargers because it takes at least six times as long to charge. They're each 120 kilowatts, so you need a 14.4 megawatt substation. Now, that doesn't mean much even to me, but 14.4 megawatt substation uh, is equal to the average consumption of 32,000 homes in the UK. And that's for one motorway services. Um, and that's without trucks charging. And trucks are looking at one megawatt chargers on their own for one truck. So it's, th uh, uh, it's, um, it's theoretically possible, but it's wildly, wildly impractical and expensive. And if you've got one battery car and one hydrogen car in the UK, the battery car is easy enough. You can trickle charge, albeit slowly at home. A hydrogen car is a nightmare. But as you scale it, that situation completely reverses because a hydrogen pump like a petrol pump can support thousands of vehicles, whereas a battery charger can only support a handful. And as you scale it, 
it becomes dramatically cheaper to install hydrogen infrastructure than battery charging infrastructure. By the way, how long does it take to refuel that car, the Rasa? It's about three minutes. Okay. Depends on the various char I mean, the fast, the fast refuelers could do it in one and a half minutes. Okay, so by all accounts, it sounds like hydrogen cars are m uh, much better in just in general. Well, than for some, for battery some cars. I mean, I, I do want to defend battery cars. It's, it's, um, I don't really want to defend. No, battery you don't cars, really want to def def defend battery cars. But there is this eighty twenty rule that we hear all the time that that eighty percent of journeys are less than twenty miles, and that's probably true. And I absolutely agree that we should be using battery cars for those sort of journeys. But there's the corollary to that. 80-20 rule that nobody ever points out. And that is that 80% of miles are driven in the other 20% of journeys. And that's 80% of the problem. And that's where we need hydrogen. It's those all those longer range applications where you are uh, covering some serious mileage. Okay, but if hydrogen cars and trucks and vehicles are so desirable, how come it has taken so long to mm. develop them? So well, Ta tell us about the business models and the lock-in effects yeah. of industrial vehicle manufacturing, which have dogged efficiency for decades. Um, <laughs> where, where to begin? Yeah, yes. Um, the reason we got battery cars now is really because of the legislation that has come into force in the EU, uh, which mandates that they, the manufacturers have got to meet a fleet average of 95 grams per CO2 per kilometer per car. And very few, well, none of them are actually achieving that. Um, <coughs> if you, and you pay 95 euros, as it happens, per gram per kilometer per car over that fleet average. So if you make only a million cars, which is a fairly small manufacturer in these OEMs. Oh, grams of what? You have grams to please of CO2. Clar okay, yeah. important to clarify. Um, if you make only a million cars and your fleet average is 105 grams per kilometer, you will pay a 950 million euro fine. And that is fairly swinging, even for th those big manufacturers. If, on the other hand, you make a zero emission car, it counts as three cars in working out your fleet average. It's, it's called a super credit. And so it's worth making battery cars at a loss because it's going to bring down the fines by more than the loss. And um, uh, the only thing they're ready to make is, pet is battery cars because, by and large, I, I think over the last 30 years, the industry has known about the technology they need, but they're much more interested in the quarterly returns and they've been sitting on their hands. And what money they have spent, they've spent on lobbying against the regulations to kick the can down the road, delaying the regulations, watering them down, and then cheating when they come into force, all of which we've seen in the last 20 years. And now that the regulations are in force, they've got to make zero emission cars. The only thing they're ready to make is battery cars. We've had battery cars as long as we've had petrol cars. In fact, the land speed record was broken by a battery car in 1899 the first car to do 100 kilometers an hour. So there is no rocket science to making a battery car. We've got better batteries, but the way in which you make the car and the architecture of the car hasn't changed. And so they have to roll out these battery cars and to, to avoid the fines, but they've got to sell them. And they can't sell them if they say, well, hang on, this is a stopgap measure. We're going to sell you something else in five years' time. They've got to say, this is the future. And that's what they're saying. That's what the politicians are supporting them in saying. Even though the senior executives are now speaking out quite openly, saying it's not, it's not the answer, and we can't do it, and we won't. And um, and so uh, we're in a in a uh, they're in a bit of a pickle now. They've really designed themselves into a corner. And I think every OEM in the world now has a hydrogen vehicle program, including the ones who won't admit it. Um, it's, it's simply a matter of time. And of course the economics are going hell, um, hell for leather in the wrong direction for them. You may have noticed that the auto industry in the UK particularly is in a real pickle. It's in a pickle all over the Europe. But in the UK, our production has dropped by more than 50% since 2016. And if you're going to make battery cars, the 80% of the cost of the battery, which is a huge proportion of the cost of the car, is in the raw materials. And whatever the Daily Mail says, when demand for raw materials goes up, the price goes up, not down. So batteries are just going to get more expensive. And in fact, they've come down until now 
and they, th they have recently been going up again. I think we've reached the dip, and it's now just going to be ever upwards because uh, the, the, the demand for these raw materials is absolutely immense, and it takes you eight years to open up a new mine. So it's and there's a limit to the amount of materials that are there, even if we do want to destroy the planet to get it. Okay, now I want to make sure we dig into the, the business model innovation. Now, um, because of regulatory mandate, vehicle manufacturers have had to transition to low emission vehicles. However, they have continued to manufacture battery powered vehicles in traditional pressed steel body mm. automotive plants, yep. which you don't do, so I please, explain this there's a giant there's a giant yeah. comparison to be made between the traditional conventional automotive industry take make use dispose model yeah. and river simples so why don't, why don't you unpack that for us yeah so we, we've sort of really been working on what's now become known as the circular economy uh, since i started this which was in 1999 when i was doing an mba and um and the whole company's been premised on the base that we'll never sell a car and <coughs> I think that actually, as big a um, change that we need to see is, is as the technology is a change in business models. If you sell cars, you make more money by selling more cars. So your interests are obsolescence and high running costs. The, the average markup on spare parts is 1,500%. And so you can see where the money's made. Um, but also, if you're making more money by selling more cars, you're rewarded for maximizing resource consumption. And I don't see how we can ever have a sustainable industrial system based on rewarding industry for the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. It's simply not going to work. We've got to align business interests with the outcomes we seek. Because otherwise, the only thing left is regulation, which as I've already pointed out is a rubbish way of achieving the outcomes because it, it, it reduces profit, so industry will only lobby against the regulations and cheat. So We'd have to align interests. It's a much more effective way of getting the outcomes we seek than trying to regulate. And so by not selling the car, we, I mean, we offer the car under a contract, typically for three years. So it's very much like leasing or a car or taking, uh, buying a new car under a PCP. The ownership of the car resides with the finance company. But you still regard it as your car, and it's at home, and you pay a, a monthly fee. In our case, you pay a monthly fixed fee and a mileage rate in a monthly direct debit. And that is the only transaction you have. It covers all your costs. It doesn't just include the maintenance of the car, but it includes insurance, and particularly it includes fuel. So when you fill up with hydrogen, you don't pay. The bill comes to us. The second difference from a lease is that at the end of the three-year contract, the car comes back to us, but we don't sell it into second-hand trade. We keep it on our balance sheet, and we offer it to second, a third, fourth-hand customer. And we believe that the long tail of the market is actually a lot longer than the industry would have us believe. And after about a car seven or eight years old, people don't really care what age it is and whether it's the latest sexy model. They're interested in the price and the reliability. And a car from us that's 10 years old will be cheaper than a new one, but it'll be just as reliable, because otherwise we wouldn't supply it to you, because we're responsible for it till end of life. So our interests are longevity and low running costs. And we're rewarded for resource conservation rather than consumption, because the car's going to be ours at end of life, and we know that when we design it. So we design it for maximum recovery of value at end of life. And that's not just raw materials, but it's also components that can be refurbished and used again in another car. Okay, because your business model incentivizes fuel efficiency as well as longevity, what are the characteristics of the car or the components or the materials which yeah. otherwise would be impossible to, um, to, to justify yes. in, a conventional, in a conventional business model? Yes, this business model fundamentally changes the, the economics and the design choices you make when you're designing the car. Because as Jan says, we, are, we have a direct vested interest in efficiency. So it's worth our while investing in efficiency. And one of the, um, um, uh, uh <coughs> one of the um, more surprising, well, first of all, uh, the car's designed for this model, so it has no moving parts other than the wheels. So there's no mechanical wear, there's no lubricants, there's no oil changes. All the structural materials are made from carbon fiber, they're inert, so there's no corrosion. 
and all the components that do degrade, and there are some, like the fuel cell, are designed to be service items. So there's no component that if it fails, it economically takes the car off the road. So we can keep the car going indefinitely, just get look older and have more wear and tear, but we can keep on keeping it on the road. We model over a 20-year life because the average car is 14 and a half years, and people sort of can get their head around that. But quite frankly, it could go on longer. And it's up to us when we take it off the road and recycle it. One of the more surprising things it leads to is that we can make the car out of carbon fibre. And this is one conversation you cannot have with anybody from the auto industry, because the auto industry are so obsessive um, about unit cost, um, and they have really honed it to a fine art. I don't believe there's a product on the planet that's remotely as good value for money as a modern car with all its complexity and refinement. But it is absolutely obsessive the way in which they get every tenth of a penny out of every component. And as they say, you'll never beat steel because it's jolly good at what it does and it'll all carbon will always be more expensive. And they think it's only for McLaren and so on. But in our model, if we use it, make, carb make it out of carbon fibre, we can have a smaller fuel cell because it's a lighter car. Um, we've got no transmission system, uh, no gearboxes, no drive shafts, anything like that. So we get rid of an awful lot of the, the, the weight heavy bits of the powertrain so we can have a lighter chassis, which is made even lighter by having carbon fibre. And then you have these mass decompounding iterative loops. If you make the, 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 the powertrain lighter and the chassis lighter, you need less power, so the powertrain gets lighter. And then the tires get narrower, so because you, you, you don't need so much contact patch to, 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 to corner with. And as the tires get narrower, you don't need power-assisted steering, so you get rid of the power-assisted steering system. So all these are step changes, again, reducing weight. All the time, reducing the cost, reducing the complexity, reducing the maintenance reducing the material content, and increasing the efficiency of the car. And <coughs> What about the fuel cell, so Hugo? So we, so we save money on the fuel cell. We save money on the supercapacitors, which are, uh, we haven't mentioned yet, but we'll come on to that. Uh, we save money on the electric motors. But also, we build a much more efficient car. And we're paying for the fuel for the life of the car, for at least 20 years. And the premium, we th the money we save on that fuel will more than offset the premium of making the car out of carbon fibre. So we argue that we can make more profit out of a carbon fiber car than a metal car at the same price to the customer, long even though it's much more expensive to make. Okay, now how powerful is that? Did you actually invent that fuel cell or innovate no, the no. fuel cell in any way? Because I think this is a crucial part of the story as well. Yeah, we are we're actually using existing available off-the-shelf technology. I mean, the first real car we built was in 2005, and we took three years to convince uh, Innovate UK, what they're called now, but um, to give us a million pounds towards that uh, with Morgan Cars. And one of the real problems, why it took us three years, is because we said, we're doing this with existing available off-the-shelf technology. And they, their reaction is, well, what are we funding? If there's no widgets, no material, no new component that they can patent, what's in it for UK PLC? And you think, well, a 300% improvement in efficiency might be of interest, but the system level innovation, they just they just couldn't, couldn't what spot. What do you mean? So what you remember your so forklift? So yes. You yeah, so so tell us about our that. Our car's got a fuel cell from a forklift truck. Um, it's only 10 kilowatts. It can just boil three domestic kettles, but it's enough to keep that car moving at 60 miles an hour. Um, and uh, 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 it has the same, yet it has acceleration of, naught to 60 in nine and a half seconds, uh, which is the same as Toyota's hydrogen car, the Mirai. That's got a fuel cell that's 12 times as powerful, and it uses three times as much hydrogen. Theirs is a brilliant fuel cell. It's brilliant engineering, but they're trying to incrementally put hydrogen into a car that's designed for petrol engines. And, and the only way they can make it work is throw money at the basic science. We're using existing available off-the-shelf technology and and putting it together in a different pattern of relationships. And it wasn't really quite true when we said this 20 years ago, but it is now. We are using um, nothing that's beyond commercial uh, viability now. Okay, but nevertheless, the car, and well, the business model is totally revolutionary. Now, on that, on that and subject, they are yeah. absolutely intertwined. And, and one of the problems we face is that people always we're so, it's so ingrained in us now that we cha change, uh, uh, changing one thing at a time is the prudent thing to do. It's absolutely true if you're refining a material system, but it's catastrophic if you're trying to go through a step change. 
And Toyota, I think, have proven that. They've spent, I know, a few years ago, I heard a figure of nine billion to achieve a car that needs 12 times as much power and uses three times as much hydrogen. It's a five-seater car, not a two-seater. But the difference shouldn't be so big. And we have spent nothing like nine billion, I can assure you of that. So, um, uh, but the breakthrough is at the system level, and it's, it's, right. it's always underrated. I, I'm from a motorsport background, actually, I used to design racing cars, and, and so I often use a motorsport analogy. We dominate motorsport in the UK now, but in the 50s, we were nowhere. And it's dominated by Ferrari by the late 50s. They had hundreds of people building beautiful, jewel-like engines. That was the heart of the beast, as far as they were concerned. And then, in 1959, five men in a shed in Kingston went and bought a four-cylinder engine off the shelf that anybody else could buy. It was much less powerful. And they built a different sort of car. And they turned up at Monaco in 1959 with Jack Brabham. He won that, the first Grand Prix. He won five out of nine Grand Prix that season. And completely demolished Ferrari. And then Lotus came along. And between them, Lotus and Cooper built the foundations of the modern motorsport industry. But the important thing about this story is that neither company ever built an engine. They did all that through system-level innovation. And, and it's, it is routinely underrated. But when you're going through system-level innovation, you have to change multiple things simultaneously. And when you're going through a step change, changing things sim multiple things simultaneously reduces all the risks and barriers, uh, but it's, it's deeply counterintuitive in our sort of Western mindset. And, uh, and, and the same is true not just of the car technology, but of the business model. There is no incremental path from what the industry is doing today to what we're, we're doing. Okay, I want to actually um, ask you about the Mirai and Toyota. It has, have they needed to spend nine billion because their sunk cost in industrial manufacturing infrastructure is so, is so huge yeah. that they must try to jerry-rig a solution or a hydrogen car um, manufacturing solution I into their shoehorn it into their existing yeah. infrastructure. They're, 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 they're trying to p put hydrogen into a car that's designed for a petrol engine and say the fuel cell to behave like a petrol engine, which it really doesn't do very well. And um, But it's not just the architecture of the car. It's a whole culture of the uh, design team behind it. It's the manufacturing strategy and model they've got and their sunk investments in that manufacturing capacity. It's the distribution model they've got. It's the business model they've got. They're trying to incrementally put hydrogen into that that has evolved for over 100 years around the characteristics of petrol engines and steel-bodied cars. And, uh, a and really, it places enormous stress on the fuel cell technology. Fuel cells are fundamentally much less power dense than petrol engines. You get an enormous amount of power from a small box with a petrol engine. You don't with a fuel cell. And if you're going to uh, uh, just take out the petrol engine, put in the fuel cell, you've got to persuade the fuel cell to do something it's not comfortable doing. That's where the nine billion has gone. Okay, now let's also now let's move on to uh, now. So, what is the current? What what do you expect to see in the coming years for hydrogen transport uh, adoption? I mean, what would you you know? And, and then take it mm. down to the River Simple, like the the specific case of River Simple's um, evolution as a business, and what are the next steps? Yes, well, we've been. I mean, well, our evolution as a business, we've been we've developed five generations of car over the last twenty years. Um, we've done it on about 16 million of equity plus some grants and things like that. Um, <coughs> and we are now just started work on designing a production car. That We're building 20 of those. We've got half a dozen of them in trials at the moment. But it was never designed to be a usable, practical, everyday car. By the way, this is not aiming at the Tesla end of the market. This is priced at the, at the equivalent of a bottom-of-the-range Golf or Mini. In, a, in terms of cost of ownership. How much would that be? Um, it's about, well, 10,000 miles a year. It'll be about £500 a month. And um, so we are now designing a car. It'll still be a two-seater, and it's designed for local use. And this touches on, the, um, on the, the, uh, how you grow the infrastructure. Um, there's over 3 million, and it's a two-seater. Uh, it'll, have, it'll have about three-inch higher seats. So it's easier to get in and out of, better rear three-quarter vision and a bigger boot. But that was never briefed to be a, a usable car, and um, it was really designed to show off the technology, quite frankly. Um, we, um <coughs> if, you, if you build a motorway-capable car like the Toyota Mirai, 
Effectively, I think Toyota are saying to governments, look, we've invested all this money, done this brilliant engineering, which it is, but we need 300 filling stations to create a market for our great big limo. Um, and, and poor little us at Toyota, we can't afford that. And, and so governments, you've got to pay. And that, to my mind, is not a strategy. It's just passing the buck. If, on the other hand, you design a car for local use, that critical scale of infrastructure comes down from 300 filling stations to just one. Now, it's a small market, but if you put a, a filling station in Oxford, we often use an example of Oxford, the Oxford Ring Road. If a, um, uh, a filling station on the Ring Road puts in a single hydrogen pump, that creates a market for um, anybody who wants a local car has a reason to come in once a week into Oxford. It has a 300-mile range, not for a 300-mile journey, but to be at least a week's use of fuel. And if we put 100 cars into that uh, local market, they, the, the filling station has got 100 captive customers from day one. And there are over 3 million cars in the UK that operate in a 25-mile radius. So that's the market we're after initially because it brings all the infrastructure barriers down and it means it's a business case for the filling station to put in one hydrogen pump on their forecourt. How much, how much does that cost? How much does that cost, one hydrogen At filling station? At the moment, it's about half a million. It'll come down okay. in, uh, as it, but I mean, we, we spent, we put in a filling station in Abergavenny, and that cost us 300 grand. Now, it's not big enough to support a, a large number of cars, but um, 500,000, but it, 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 it easily breaks even with, a, with a, a small number of vehicles, as long as you can guarantee them. If you put 100 Toyota Mirais into the country and 300 filling stations, the filling each filling station will hardly ever see a customer. It'll be years till they break even, whereas this concentrates the demand and builds a strong business case. And then you work with local council with local buses and refuse collection vehicles, both of which are being built now running on hydrogen. And that just increases the demand. All sorts of vehicles that have local duty cycles. Okay, so what state, uh, what phase of commercialization or rollout or pilot testing are you in now? Well, we've got a pilot running in, um, in Monmouthshire, filling station Abergavenny, retail customers um, paying the cost, the prices that we would expect to charge when we're in the market. And that works out, it's £295 a month, 18 p a mile, and VA VAT on top of all that. And um, uh, those cars have been in trials last year in Milford Haven and Pembrokeshire with the Port Authority and the County Council. Um, we're building that up to a fleet of 20 vehicles. We're talking to the County Council to bring about bringing other vehicles into the, into the trial as well. And we'll run this trial until we're in production, and that will transition seamlessly into one of our uh, seed markets. We're looking at eight to 10 markets initially, and the first plant if, w if the money arrives in a timely fashion, which it tends not to, but if it were to, we could be in production by the end of 26 uh, with a, a plant making 5,000 vehicles a year. One of the key things about composites is that 5,000 uh, 5, vehicles a year is a viable scale of production in a mainstream segment. If you make steel cars, that's about 300,000. A pressed steel tool costs you... Special tooling costs about a billion for a new car, but it does spit out 300,000 cars a year. So that's how many you assemble on site. That's what drives the enormous scale of, of car plants today. If you do it out of composites, you can only get about 5,000 cars through the tooling each year. So that's how many you assemble on site. When you expand production, you need more sets of tooling, but there's no economic advantage of putting them in the same place. So you build more small plants, each with a new set of tooling. The tooling is about 100 times cheaper, but it's about 100 times lower throughput. So the economics still stack up, but it means that you can add capacity in much smaller increments, much smaller plants, much less infrastructural burden, much shorter lead time to more build a new plant. More flexibility. And much more flexibility because each plant's got different tooling, so it can make a different car. So we don't have to have the one-size-fits-all solution that the auto industry has. And I mean, it's exemplified by the way they test cars in in Death Valley, and they test them in the Arctic because they want a world car. They use the term, a world car, which is not. It's a car designed for Western Europe that we flog to the rest of the world because it's what we make. But whoever drives from Death Valley to the Arctic? You don't. You, do, you need a different car in that you live in a different house in Death Valley or the Arctic, and you need a different car. And the same is true of Portugal versus Norway or let alone India or something like that. We should be making different cars in different places. 
Now, how long have you been working on that car? Um, the first, well, we I started academically looking at the, uh, the this uh, new model of uh, of how to manufacture cars in 99 when I was doing an MBA at Cranfield. But uh, first uh, set the company up in 2001. First car, uh, well, first car was 2003. That was for the Shell Eco Marathon. Tiny little thing that could take a 12-year-old 45 kilo driver. Um, it could do 7,000 mpg equivalent. Um, but then the first proper car we did was with Morgan, and that was 2005 to 8. We showed that at Geneva in 2008. Um, uh, we did the first car that we, and that was only in in test cells, really. It was a pure R&D blue sky project. Um, looked very glamorous, but didn't actually run on its own wheels. And then we did a car that you could drive, a um, smart-sized car, to demonstrate we could get all the technology under the seats and under the bonnet. And that was uh, ran through to 2013 when we started our first car that was designed for use on the public road. That first ran in 2016, and second generation was in 2019. So it's been a long haul. It's been a long haul, but um, there is no doubt that you could have radically compressed this time scale for development had you taken VC funding, because I think the number you mentioned for the amount you've had to invest is actually tiny. What was it again? Six, did you say 16? 16 million equity, okay, that's about, nothing. Um, about another 10 million in grants, and, uh, and about 15, 20 million has gone into it in collaborative projects with other partners. So I, I have to ask, because it's very clear that your model has been one of finance through bootstrapping instead of taking external VC funding, which ordinarily would have um, been in the probably a few hundred million. And what's been the trade-off? And, and please tell us about your extremely innovative um, corporate governance model, which partly explains this time scale. Yes, I mean, the company's set up with a long view. We're trying to build something that's got real value, aligned with uh, the needs of society in the long term. And, um, and the sad truth is that uh, VC money is all about early-term exits, and they require a level of control that allows them to maximize the value of the company at their point of exit. That leads to totally different decisions to the decisions you would make if you're interested in the long-term health of the company. And so we've got a corporate governance model that is designed to um, bring a better balance between the short and the long-term in decision-making. Um, I think that the primacy of shareholder value is one of the key barriers we have to a sustainable planet, um, because especially with listed companies, because if shares can be traded in seconds, analysts are only looking at quarterly returns. And, and if you're subject to that, um, uh, that trading, boards, however long-term they would like to think, have to keep the analysts happy, have to make decisions in the short term, even if they're counter to the long-term interest of the company. So our company is actually not controlled by investors. It is still absolutely a for-profit company. And for long-term investors like pension funds, we believe it's a much better investment because it is all about building long-term value. And pension funds want to see safe and reliable income coming out of their investment for decades. The thing they're terrified of is not being able to pay the pensions of somebody who's in their 20s now. And they're really concerned about it. So the, there's a large portion of the investment community that is very interested in long-term uh, long decision-making. So our company uh, is still a for-profit company. The, f the profits go in the same direction as a normal company. The equity investors take the dividends but the control is quite separate from the equity investment. All the equity shares, and there's only one class of equity share, has no direct voting rights. There are only six shares that have got voting rights, but they've got no equity rights. And those six shares are held by six companies that we set up, limited by guarantee, like a, 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 a lots of charitable organizations, uh, they have no money flowing through them, but they represent the interests of the six critical stakeholders on whom the company depends. That's the investors, the environment, the staff, the customers, the supply chain, and the community. And the community is all those bodies who are interested in 
are impacted by the uh, activities of the company but have no direct commercial relationship. So if bodies interested in road safety or air quality, local government interested in employment, things like this. And each of those bodies has one voting share. They're all equal. So each, each of those stakeholder groups has a 17% vote, basically, in the, in, the, in the outcomes of the company. They don't sit on the board. They meet in an AGM. They all have to agree to the annual strategy of the company. If we go beyond that annual strategy that's been agreed, we have to go back to their share those shareholders. But critically, nobody can dig their heels in and, uh, because nobody has a power of veto. Even a special resolution, which is the highest level of agreement needed to make it any change, is 75%. So no single vote can block a, a um, anything that the company that the other five stakeholders want to do, and that means that you're embedded, you're embedding structurally in this organisation cooperation as the fundamental dynamic. If you want to dig your heels in, you're going to be ignored. The only way to get what what you want and your uh, your interests represented is to cooperate with the other stakeholders, and that means that no the company cannot make decisions in the interests of the investors in the short term that threaten the other five benefit streams. So you could never get into a deep water horizon or dieselgate situation, which is all about playing fast and loose with other benefit streams for the sake of generating better short-term returns. And so we have investors in the company who have no interest in cars, but recognize that it's a better investment for them. They've, rec they've invested because of the governance model. Sadly, we've got far more investors who haven't invested because of the governance model. But increasingly, uh, it, is no, it is seen as not a barrier to investment. And we're finding it much, much easier to articulate this argument. The rise of ESG in the last two years means that uh, it's, it's, it's on everybody's lips. And we are way ahead of the game on that. All right, well, no, that's a good um, ending. Unt uh, and now I'm going to open the floor to questions, if anybody has questions. Good, excellent. Uh, uh, sir, oh, could you pass the mic? I'll <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Neil Ward from the University of East Anglia. Wh where did the inspiration for that corporate governance model come from? Is that something that you saw somewhere else and replicated, or did you evolve it? <laughs> You know, we evolved it. I mean, I, I did. I, I had some inspiration from uh, an article in Fast Company in '97 um, called "The Trillion Dollar Vision of D. Hock." D. Hock was the man who really created the modern visa model, and he based that on largely on um, evolutionary and biological principles. And there's an article about that and him meeting somebody at Santa Fe Institute called Joel Getzendanner. They together set up something called the Chaotic Commons. Chaotic is a term they coined, the, the, the nexus of chaos and order, where all living systems operate. It's a state far from equilibrium, a dynamic state that's very agile. And they use that as the, m the model for a, a really effective organization. They set up the Chaotic Commons. I went to the Chaotic Commons first conference in 2001 in, in Virginia, and I met Joel Getzendown, and he and I worked together to build the model. The starting point was... that. Um, the economists talk about the basket of interests uh, of, 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 of the consumer. And I wanted to represent the basket of interests in the governance model of the company. And, um, but I had no idea how to do it. So the big structural ideas came from Joel. Um, uh, the, the intent was, was this basket of interests. All right, next so question. we talk about, actually, another thing I didn't say, we talk about three levels of design. D1 is the and design, the design world is now beginning to talk about this, that D1 is the product design, what the Bauhaus did. And, and nowadays, more and more, we're seeing level D2, which is design at the level of systems. Um, and so business models and strategies and so on. And they interact. D3 is not really talked about. And that's design at the level of ideology, purpose, governance, sustainability. And we we are trying to integrate all three levels of design in developing the business. And they all interact wildly. Okay. 
there were other questions. Yeah, here you go. Uh, I wonder if I might ask a couple of questions. Um, as I understand it, hydrogen is used in two ways, either a fuel cell or you burn it, as JCB are trying to do. So I wondered if you could just talk about the two different applications, because it seems to me that fuel cell is for a light car and burning it is better for diggers and that's only heavy equipment. Here, here you go, here you go. Also, why don't you just talk about how it's a perfect substitute for natural gas, because that's part of the, the answer, and we didn't cover mm. that. Yes, we didn't cover that. Um, I mean, I'll come back to that, but I mean, uh, we absolutely believe, uh, as a number of utilities do, that we've got to move our gas grid to hydrogen, um, replace methane with hydrogen. Our gas grid was until the mid-60s. It was 60% hydrogen anyway when it came from town gas, so it's entirely doable. But um, uh, Burn it directly. This, yeah. this is um, addressing his question. I didn't really explain what a fuel cell is. Maybe I, I, I should. Um, you can burn hydrogen like any fuel. It's combustible. Um, you can burn it in, in a petrol engine. Um, you adapt it slightly, but it's just a matter of the, the fuel injection. And, um, or you can put it through a fuel cell. Now, a fuel cell is a new device. And this is, I didn't really <laughs> didn't explain this. Fuel cell technology is, is new, unlike batteries. This is why we're seeing all the battery cars. Fuel cell technology has only been, was invented in 1839 in Swansea by Sir William Grove. He demonstrated the phenomenon. It is electrolysis in reverse. So we're all familiar with the, the sort of school experiment, having a beaker of water, passing electricity through, and out bubbles hydrogen and oxygen. And you're putting that electricity in as energy to split the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen. And the hydrogen and oxygen are very high energy states. When they combine, they normally go bang, and that's what happens in a combustion engine. But in a fuel cell, you put them back in to the same process, and that process runs in reverse. And so out comes electricity and water. It's much more difficult to make it go that way, unfortunately. But it has no moving parts, and it puts out the energy as electricity rather than heat. And it's much more efficient than a combustion engine. A combustion engine is about 25% efficient for a petrol engine, 30% for a diesel engine, uh, fuel cell about 50%, 55%. And, um, uh, but it's new, and it was only in the 50s that uh, somebody called Bacon at Cambridge developed it to actually being a workable fuel cell, a very low power, and it was bought by NASA, and the only use of fuel cells until recently was NASA for all the command capsules in space. They had the electricity for the instruments, say one kilowatt coming from a fuel cell, but they only needed one kilowatt, and they really couldn't give a monkeys what the price was. So that's why it was really <laughs> not a practical solution for a vehicle. Um, and then in the 90s, it started being developed to the point where it could be practical for a, a vehicle. Combustion engines are a much easier path forward to adopt hydrogen. And, um, and, I, uh, and, and JCB are doing it. It's not because it's, it's better for big vehicles. It's because JCB require a very robust, they require very robust technology. And, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but I know the R&D director there, and he, he regards the fuel cell industry still as a, a cottage industry. Um, they will adopt them, I'm sure, when, when it's technically um, uh, viable uh, for them. They're running fuel cell diggers at the moment, large-scale excavators in prototype form. But in the meantime, they're not reliable and robust enough for a construction site. And it allows them to keep the supply chain, making com uh, combustion engines and crankshafts and pistons and so on. It's an easy transition. And bring in the refueling to construction sites, get used to that before they transition to, to um, a, a fuel cell technology. But it's a, it's a way off till it's going to be suitable for them. Um, it's always going to be better in most applications, a fuel cell, because A, it's much more efficient, and B, because it doesn't produce any noxes. Uh, uh, if you burn anything, you still produce nox. Nox is not a product of the fuel. It's nitrogen oxide, and it comes from the air that's going through the engine, and uh, because the combustion temperature is high enough, it oxidizes the nitrogen, and it actually comes as nox, which is a highly damaging uh, gas. And... Um, so even if you run hydrogen in, in civil aircraft, you're still going to produce contrails and knocks up in, up in the sky. So it's, um, I know that Airbus are not confident that in 2050 they're going to be able to fly a combustion engine plane and, um, at all, even on hydrogen. Uh, the, the second half of my question was going to be uh, hydrogen supply, and uh, because that seems to be a bit of a barrier. Uh, you know, ah. it's, it's too expensive and... 
Thanks yes, so. and that's, uh, that's a complete myth, I'm afraid. It's, but it is peddled widely. And so <laughs> um, uh, most hydrogen at the moment comes from natural gas. Of course, it emits CO2. But it is a 75% efficient process. The biggest single component of our electricity grid is still natural gas. 40% of our electricity over the year comes from natural gas at 49% efficiency. So why is electricity at 49% efficient good and hydrogen at 75% efficient is bad? It's much less lower CO2 footprint than electricity. Now, of course, we've got to get to green hydrogen, but we absolutely advocate a seamless transition, gradual, not an overnight step. We didn't go from 100% brown electricity to 100% green. We didn't say you can't do a battery, you use a battery car unless it's green electricity, and we shouldn't do that with hydrogen. We, w what we've got to do with hydrogen, like we do have done with electricity, is focus on gradually reducing the carbon intensity of the electricity grid and ditto the hydrogen grid. And I believe that's an important role to play for grey hydrogen. We, at the moment, make 70 million tonnes of hydrogen a year industrially from natural gas, mostly about 90%. And 70 million tonnes of hydrogen is a shed load of hydrogen because it really doesn't weigh very much. Um, and, and so it doesn't really matter who burns or uses that grey hydrogen. We've just got to get more green into the system. Who uses which molecule is irrelevant. And, and if we say you can only do hydrogen cars on green hydrogen and you can only put in an electrolyzer that uses, if it uses 100% green electricity, it hobbles everything. And the reason it hobbles the electrolyzing to make hydrogen from electrolysis is if you say it can only use green electricity, it can probably only run about 60% of the time. So to get the, um, a report the Welsh Government a couple of years ago said that if you put in um, uh, an electrolyzer to achieve the same output of hydrogen as a 10 megawatt electrolyzer that runs 24-7 and say it can only use green hydrogen, you'd have to put in a 16 megawatt electrolyzer i.e. 60% extra capex just because you want it to work, operate only part-time. And it really slows everybody down. It doesn't help anybody except the people who don't want to see hydrogen at all. Okay. Uh, hello. I've got a question about the car buyer's tastes. So over the last while, the only cars that people are buying have been massive, gigantic SUVs. And do you think we'll see a shift in people's tastes as time goes on? And following that, do you think people will ever feel safe in small electric cars when they're surrounded by much, much larger cars? Mm -hmm. Very good question. And, and, um, and I mean, it brings me back to the obesity problem that I talk about. Uh, I'm not actually sure. There, there is an arms race with, with cars. Um, people think they're safer in bigger cars. Um, but to be honest, uh, the industry has a huge part to play in our so-called so tastes. And they push bigger cars. And uh, the reason they push bigger cars is it, the perceived value of a bigger car is much greater. You can sell it at a much higher price, say 20% extra, even though it costs you 5% more to make. So they have a vested interest in seeing cars get bigger and bigger. They're now beginning to challenge um, in lobbying the concept that we should, cars are limited to three and a half tons. I mean, that's 650 kilos. Um, uh, um, it, it, it is absolutely inconceivable to my mind that we can uh, afford to have three and a half ton cars driving around on the road. But the safety issue is a myth. Um, there was a report from a university going back over 10 years in American uh, accident statistics that found no significant correlate, uh, statistically significant correlation between vehicle size and motorist safety. But they found a 2.4% increase in pedestrian fatalities per 100 kilos of vehicle mass. So another 1,000 kilos is a pretty o terrifying prospect. But there are all sorts of other problems with um, mass. It, it increased resource consumption. Um, by a massive degree. But it's also increased non-exhaust emissions. Uh, emission Analytics, who did the uh, really good data on Dieselgate a few years ago, um, produced a report last year showing that 
the non-exhaust emission particulates are 1,850 times more damaging to human health than the exhaust particulates. 1,850 times. And those are from tyres and brakes. They are pro rata to mass, and they're irrespective of powertrain. Twice the mass, you've got twice the particulates. A Swiss university last year published a report, 45% of the microplastics in groundwater are from tyres. Um, it's, it, it is a devastating problem, mass. Um, and uh, everybody is actually less safe uh, as a result. Now, I'd, we don't expect everybody to buy into this straight away. There will be the Range Rover buyers will persist. But the beauty of our model is that we break even at small volume, and we believe very strongly that there's a large enough body of opinion who are on our side, and we equally believe that if the industry were to stop pushing big cars, uh, people don't necessarily desire big cars, and they don't necessarily desire changing them all the time. Okay, well, what a great way to end uh, the talk. Thank you so much, Hugo. It was uh, really fascinating and inspiring. Thank you very much. <laughs>